Let us start our story at the very beginning with story itself. The most distinctive characteristic of human beings as a species is that we are the storytelling animal. For the longest time in human history, stories were told face to face in the community, uh, in the tribe, uh, in the family. And for many uh, hundreds of thousands of years, that was the only thing that is possible. Of course, there was also imagery, monuments like pyramids or obelisks or murals, cathedrals. They're all images and they're designed to create a sense of awe or a sense of understanding of nature or of power. This is the true magic of human life, that the stories by and through which we live are the stories that animate us, that make us seek certain things and fear other things. And for a very long time, this magic was tightly controlled. It was controlled by what we now recognize as the priesthood, as some kind of a priesthood or a tribal chief. Then, at a certain point in history, it all changes. It changes when we reach the Industrial Revolution. When the printing press is combined with the steam engine to make rapid printing possible, uh, to make the spread of literacy a virtual necessity, that presents the Industrial Revolution in storytelling. Where shall I go when I go where I go? From that point on, there are corporations that mass-produce stories and create a new kind of entity called the public. This is crucial to understand that it is the mass production of stories and of messages and of images disseminated to millions of people who could never be reached face to face by the same source. And by doing that, they establish a loose aggregation of people who have nothing in common except the publications they share. The second major change the change that is still accelerating is the electronic revolution. And the mainstream of the new electronic revolution is television. After 10 years of experiment, television, first shown to the public at the World's Fair, now takes its place as a new American art and industry. Uh, we have to recognize that television ushers in a new age. Atop a million homes, antennas pluck the pictures from the sky. At a flick of a switch or the turn of a dial, the scene reappears on the television screen. Fantastic. But our children will grow up with this miracle enriching their lives and giving them a new understanding of the whole world. Gosh. For Gerbner, here's what mattered most about all of this. This amazing new storytelling force was conceived from the start as a way to sell things. By television, American business has found a most effective advertising medium. And in turn, advertising has provided the resources that sustain the standards of programming and permit the never-ending research that is the heart of the television industry. The broadcast airwaves may belong to the public, but television in the U.S. was funded from the start almost entirely by advertising. It was private companies, not public tax dollars, as in Great Britain and other parts of the world, that bankrolled network TV programs in the U.S. So from the beginning, the primary function of TV shows was to attract large numbers of people to see the advertisements of the businesses that paid for the programs. For the first time in human history, most of the stories, most of the time, to most of the children are told no longer by the parent, no longer by the school, no longer by the church, no longer by the community, no longer handcrafted, no longer community-based, no longer historically inspired, inherited, going from generation to generation, but essentially by a small group of global conglomerates that really have nothing to tell them but have a lot to say. Let's go! From the very beginning, people have no role other than as products who are attracted to a particular program, which in effect is the bait. And boys and girls, 
boys and girls, for the very first time, we all started to eat Wonder Bread at all our meals, breakfast, lunch. Yeah. Those audiences are the audiences who are most likely to be the consumers of a particular kind of product. America's best-selling, best-tasting filter cigarette. It still tastes good like a cigarette should. And then the advertiser, in turn, pays for producing the program. From the very beginning, the public is what is bought and sold. There's one for you, and there's one for you, John. It certainly was a fine first travel. You know, everybody's buying more and more. Because... And out of this comes an inescapable and highly pervasive cultural environment now produced essentially to sell. Brought to you by Coca-Cola. For Gerbner, the commercial nature of this environment was fundamental. Say it. When you call, I want you to say, I'm making a thousand dollar vow of faith. Say the word, thousand dollars. Say it. Operating as businesses first, media corporations present a certain kind of world, a world built to sell, offering up a distinct brand of reality shaped by the demands of the marketplace. Everything else stems from this commercial logic from the fundamental fact that private corporations decide what fills the public airwaves. Today, a handful of global conglomerates own and control the telling of all the stories in the world. They have global marketing formulas that are imposed on the creative people in Hollywood, and I, I'm in touch with them, and they hate it. They say, don't talk to me about censorship from Washington. I never heard about that. I get censorship every day. I'm told, put in more action, cut out complicated solutions. They apply this formula because it travels well on the global market. These are formulas that need no translation, that are essentially image-driven, that speak action in any language, and of course, the leading element of that formula is violence. 